Hello, and welcome back to What's Bubbling at Zimbule. I am Dr. Abstract, and in this bubbling we're going to continue to look at what's new in Zimcat. And in this one we're going to look specifically at wire. So, let's go to the Zim site at zimjs.com. We'll press on the cat, and then into the examples. In the last bubbling we took a look at the Zim synth, and indeed the Zim synth also uses wire or wired and that wires up the dial and these sliders to the sound but the next example right here is one specifically on ZimWire so let's go into that one as we change the dial and make its current value get bigger or smaller that changes the scale of the circle so the dial is wired to the circle dial dot wire to the circle and its scale. This one's a little bit different. The rectangle and the slider, it, it does look like it's doing kind of the same thing. It's got these warning tracks that makes it a little bit different. But watch this. When we pick up the rectangle, it also changes the slider. So this is wired two ways. Slider.wire to the rectangle, the X property, and true for two ways. So now changing the x of this will change the slider's value. Isn't that neat? Okay, let's go into the code and see how this is done then more specifically. Here we are with Zimcat 00. And we scroll on down. Here's the circle. There's the dial. And look, we chain right on, right on to that a wire. And we say, please wire the circle, and the, the, the value that we want to change is the scale. So how that works is, by default, uh, the Zim components have uh, usually either a current value or a selected index. So that's what is assumed, is that it's, it's going to look at the current value first, and based on the current value, if there is a current value, then it's going to use that. If there's no current value property, it will use the selected index property, and if there's no selected index property, it uses whatever's, whatever's here. So for instance, the rectangle right here, we're wiring up the slider. We, there it is with the X property, for instance. If we wired, say, a circle to a rectangle, neither of those have a current value or a selected index property. So if we wired up their Y property, as we change the Y property, the other's Y property would, would change. And if we made that two-way, then it would work either way. Isn't that neat? So uh, we skipped over these. Let's just pop on back. There's the rectangle. Here's a slider. And note that the slider has no selected index set right there or a current value or whichever one it, it starts off with. A slider, I think, starts with the current. You can set a current value, and the slider will start at that value. So by default, if we have a min of 0, by default the slider is starting at 0. And that's going to cause a problem, and we have to address that. Come on down here. So here we are wiring, we're still chaining. This was a bunch of explanation that you can come in and take a, a read through that. We're going to go through it now though. So we've dot pose this. This is on the slider, dot pose, but no, no end semicolon there. So dot wire, we're just chained right on to the end. We're wiring to the rectangle, the X, the true means two way. Uh, this next one is set the source to whatever the target is. There's two, two things. There's whatever you're wired to is called the source and whatever you're controlling is called the target. So here the slider is the source and the rect is the target. So when we set the set source to true, what it does is it will set the, the source, which is the slider, to the value of the rectangle. If we didn't have this, if, if this were null, which is the default, or if it were false, then can you imagine what would happen? We're wiring the rectangle to the slider. Well, the rectangle is immediately going to jump to whatever the slider is at. The slider is at zero. So if we open this up in a browser, 
there it is. Because the slider is wired to the, or because the rectangle is wired to the slider, the slider is the thing in the control. So that all still works, but since the slider started at zero, <laughs> that's going to start at zero. Now we could set the slider to a certain value if we wanted to. So we could come up in here and say, comma, selected. Oh, current value. Oh, let's get those two mixed up. I'm sure you guys do as well. Current value, colon. Uh, I'm not sure what this goes up to. Oh, uh, probably more than three. This is changing the x position. <laughs> that, would, that would set it to the <laughs> value of three. But if we put it at 200, for instance, then uh, can you imagine what's going to happen? Here? Refresh. The slider set at 200. Therefore, the rectangles set at 200. But when we created that rectangle, we put it in the middle of the page, and that's where we actually wanted it to start. <laughs> so it's sort of annoying to have to, you know, manage that if, if we don't want to. So we, we don't have to. We can say, hey, just there's the slider. And what I really want is this slider to start at wherever the rectangle is to match the position of the rectangle. And that's the next parameter here. So that's this one. True. Isn't that nice? So we can use the, um, the target to set the value of the source to begin with. And that's handy. And we do that one in the synth example as well. So I'll show you that in the synth example. But let's save this up now. We put true. We've got the, the, we took away the value on the slider. Not that it would matter, I guess. But there it is. Now this stays in the middle where we placed it and where we wanted it. And we're forcing the slider to start off at that middle position going to either side. We also have in this example a function right here. So this is a function as the next parameter after which is called the filter parameter. Now filters you may have used already in Zimbind, although probably not because Zimbind was just launched in 10.9, the one, uh, the version before Zimcat. So most people I don't think have tried Zimbind yet. Zimbind is a very similar thing. We're binding a property, but uh, in Zimbind, we bind that property to something that's coming from a database. So out, outside or from local storage, but from outside of Zim and, and possibly vice versa. So it could be two way or one way there as well. And we thought about turning that internally and just calling this all bind, but there's a few things that we have to set up for Zimbind that we don't have to set up here in wire. And we're also using a different system for the updating, where instead of uh, an asynchronous system, which uh, bind is when it uh, goes to the database, we have an immediate update. Well, it's an update through the ticker. So um, our, our Zim has a ticker that is, you know, is inherited from CreateJS. But uh, Zim's ticker is a queue of things, and things like Zim Animate operate with the ticker, and you can add a, your own functions to the ticker. Wiggle operates on the ticker, and some other things, including now wire. So basically, as that ticker is going, if there's a change in the wire, then it's going to update the the, the property that's you know wanting to be updated, the target property. And then it will also do a stage.update for us, which is handy. So that means if you wire something, it knows you're wanting to change it. So it will do an update for you. If it doesn't change, it won't do that extra update. Conserve batteries. So that's the handy thing about a ticker is that it does only one stage.update no matter how many things you throw into it. At most, it would only do one. And if it doesn't need to, it won't do any. So that's handy. Well, here, this filter allows you to run a function um, before you make the change. And this is the call, and the call allows you to run a function after you make the change. So this works the same way as Zimbind, but it's here in Wire. The filter needs to return the, the data. So basically what happens with the filter is the value that's going to be set comes in, and if you don't do anything with it, you still have to return it and that sends it back out again, and then it gets changed. So then it will set the X of the rectangle. 
neat, huh? And what we're doing here is as the data comes in, we're checking to see what the data is doing or where, where it's at, and we're changing the rectangle's color if it's too close to the edge. Uh, we could do something like, we could say data time uh, divided by, well, is equal to data divided by two. Uh, divided equals, we could have done there. But um, that is taking the data and dividing it by, by two and then passing it along. So this will make it, let's, let's make it divided by four. We'll make it, you know, actually how about divided by 10. We'll hardly make it move <laughs> based on the slider. Shall we try? Of course, we could have just changed the slider's value. Ready? Here we go. So there's a, a jump because they, they weren't set up properly at the beginning now. And there it is. It's hardly moving based on the slider. So we fil we've filtered out the data, changed it, and um, then it gets applied. So if we wanted that not to jump at the beginning, we would have had to mm, start off with a smaller number somewhere. <laughs> okay, so we don't want to do that though. And I guess that's a, uh, about that. Uh, I'll show you another example of, a, of using a filter. We're going to go on and take a look at the synth. Maybe just before we leave, though, do you see what we're doing with wire? Do you sort of get the, get the idea? There it is. Look at that. We're just wiring the circle scale to match the dial. We could do that with a change event. Dot on change. Whenever the dial changes, we call this function. And then we could say something like circle dot ska sack dot ska e dot target dot current value like that with a stage dot update would be needed in here. So there we go. Basically, this is the same as that right there. Now, this is already reduced from some some systems. Certainly, the change event, for instance, or is is it's not it's a a, a chainable method that Zim has made. Normally, you would have to come out of that, and you would have to use an on. So it would be something like a var dial is equal to that. And then we would come out of it completely. We go dial dot on uh, change. Call this function, and then inside the function we would do this stuff. And if you were in regular JavaScript, this would be add event listener like that. So uh, it just keeps getting longer and longer, doesn't it? <laughs> but anyway, it would actually be a property. It would be more scale. It be, well, in, in CSS or JavaScript, it would be, or raw JavaScript, it would be even longer than that. You would have to set the transform proper style of, of a document dot get element by D. <laughs> You're probably talking about at least twice as long, basically, to, to do it in raw. But this would be scale x is equal to circle dot scale y, etc. back in the flash days. So um, we keep on making it shorter and shorter and shorter. And finally, here we are at uh, wired. Bing. Neat, huh? <laughs> What's next? We're going to go to node programming, where we just pick up this line and draw it from the dial to the circle. That would be how to do it in sort of node-based, like a touch designer or oh, who knows? It's been on for a while now. Max MSP, did that have um did that have node-based stuff? PD? Anyway. Maybe, maybe one day, but it's always been the thought, and not to digress too much, but always been the thought of Zim that we're just going to stay within code. We're not going to try and put an IDE on top of Zim, like turn it into a Flash IDE or something like that. However, nodes are cool. <laughs> maybe one day. Whatever's after cat, right? Okay, so uh, good. We wanted to take a look at the synth version as well. Hopefully I didn't mess this up too much. I don't think so. I'll just save it anyway. And uh, in the synth version, we'll do a search for wire. There it is. And here it is here as well. So in the synth version, 
you can see that we've got some information for you to read if you, if you come into these examples as well. We are changing the tone. So the synth has a tone, and we've already made the tone, and the tone already has these properties set. We set them through parameters, the wah rate, the wah note, etc., etc., etc. So you can see what we're doing here. Uh, first of all, uh, the tone is wired to these things. It is not the one that's doing the wire in a sense. So we have used the past, uh, the past tense here. It's, it's kind of like a flip thing. You can either wire, you can have a source wire something, which is the target, or you can have the ta target be wired by the source. It just depends on which one you make first, really. And it really doesn't matter which one you make first. I mean, we could have made the tone after the sliders, or we could have made the sliders before the tone. Oh, the same thing. <laughs> we could have made the sliders after, after the tone. Here we did make the sliders after the tone, um, but uh, we weren't wiring until we didn't chain it on, so it really didn't matter. We're, we're doing this after we've made both of them. All, all of them at once, all in the same place. A little bit easier to read and uh, manage. We just say, hey, let's, let's make the tone, let's make all the interface, and then look, we'll just wire it up. Bing, 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 bing. So we're saying, please, the rate is the rate slider, the note is the note slider, amount throat sliders, and then the dial is a dial. These are the properties. And we're not doing it two-way, so the, the rate is going to control the tone. It's not the other way around. The tone cannot control the rate. However, right at the beginning, we do set the source um, right here. So we're setting the source. The source in this case is the rate. We're setting the source to whatever the tone is. That's because we're in wired. This is the source. If we were in wire, and we could have done it through wire, if we were in wire, the rate would have been over here. The tone would have been here. And we would have had to put the note here and the tone here, so we would have had five different statements. Um, we just noticed that if we went the other way around, we have sort of one big long chain statement. And then uh, that's what those trues are there for. Cool. The filter that I mentioned, so there is a filter dot wired. We wired the waves. Now the waves is a little bit different. The waves is a selector, and the selector is providing 0, 1, 2, 3. So the selector is, uh, is index-based, so it's a selected index. Yet the property that we want to change, the way the wa shape property, on the tone, this is still dotted to the tone, the wah shape property on the tone doesn't accept numbers, it accepts strings like square, saw, sine, zap, those are the wave shape names that it accepts. Yet we can still wire it up by using a filter. So here's the filter function right here. And basically, we're taking in the, um, we're taking in the input, which is an index number, we are finding out from the array what's at that, and then we're passing it along. We're changing the wave type to whatever string is at that array. Isn't that cool? So I like that. Basically, our array has a bunch of strings in it. We're using the index to pass it on through. Uh, let's see, that's the wave type array index of, why do we have to get an index of the input though? Oh, if it's from, if command, ah, okay, interesting. And we returned it. <laughs> so normally that would be really easy to do. Here it is. I was wondering why we had to do something to the input there. So normally we just take the input number and pass in whatever was in the array at that input. That's the normal process. However, Remember, we are doing this one as well. We wanted to set the indicator, or sorry, we wanted to set the selector to whatever waveform the tone has at the start. And so we find the command from. So when you get a filter, I didn't show you that on the other side, we had only brought the data in, and we've always got to return the data. It doesn't have to say the word data, but whatever we return is the data. And then um, we also receive the command because it will depend. The data might be going 
um, from the source to the target, that's the normal way, or it might be going from the target to the source. That's called from. We're receiving it from the target rather than sending to the target. So the other one is to. But if it comes in as from, so if it's coming in as from, that means it's coming backwards and we're actually receiving a string and we have to set the, um, the selector to the index at that string. And that's what we're doing. So we're using the string to find the index within that array. And then that's what we're returning. And that's how we set the default of the selector. Very cool. So I didn't mean to turn this into more of an explorer, which is kind of where we're at now. The bubblings are just to show you what's new. The explorers, uh, we really take some more time uh, looking through things. We are going to do an explore on the synth in general. So if you've been wondering or waiting if that's going to happen, that will happen. Uh, right now we're going through a set of bubblings on what's new in Zimcat. And it was pretty cool to see Wired. If you're more of a, a visual person, you might look at this and go, eh, it's a little bit like data, oh, I don't know. But uh, I think Wire will help you. It's an alternative to events. It will help you get through your data stuff more quickly to connect things up. And you can then, for instance, make art with this. Who knows? <laughs> I'm hoping to see some of that. As we all are here at Zim, so and that has been a What's Bubbling at Zim. I am Dr. Abstract. Come on by zimjs.com slash slack. Join us there if you have any questions, uh, want to show your work or what have you. We'd love to have you there. Bye-bye.